Hello and welcome once again to TaxCalc TV. I'm Andy North, I'm the CMO here at TaxCalc. Um, and this week we're venturing back into the world of MTD for ITSA. Uh, if you're new to the Simple Step to MTD Readiness uh, programme, uh, this is the culmination of a major project that uh, we started um, back in at the beginning of the year uh, where we recruited a crack team of uh, practice owners uh, who happen to be tax cut customers too uh, to feed into a comprehensive timeline of activities. Uh, by following the steps, uh, you'll really address the key decisions that you're going to need to make uh, if you're going to be fully ready for uh, April 2024. So we're now on strategy two, uh, which is uh, evaluating your client base. And um, we're also going to touch on strategy three, which is about monitoring uh, clients on an ongoing basis. So once again, I am joined to do this by um, Dean uh, Shepherd, uh, the uh, Tax Couch Director of Product Compliance. Uh, Dean um, is an, also once again by Z Razak, uh, who is the Managing Director of Certax uh, St Albans. Uh, I say once again because uh, regular viewers will remember Z from our previous webinar uh, where we had uh, a lot of fun chewing through uh, the thorny issue of uh, service definition. Uh, so we invited him back for round two. Thanks for coming, Z. Um, so inevitably, there is a lot of overlap between these webinars. Uh, and if you did miss the last one, it is well worth going back and taking a look. Uh, we examined the, the kind of keystone decision that uh, you're going to need to make, which is what services are you intending to offer? Uh, so whether that be the full service, uh, where you do the bookkeeping and the quarterly submissions and the EOP, um, or a very light service where you palm parts of that off back onto your clients. Um, it was genuinely a really fascinating discussion. Uh, we revealed a lot of areas that... Uh, I think a lot of accountants hadn't really considered before. But in this session, we're going, we're looking very much at segmenting your clients. So we're going to be looking at who is in and who is out, how you can determine which uh, cohorts of your clients are, 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 are in and out, um, and also how you might move them from in to out. Um, we're also then going to look at how you handle each group. Um, so if they are going to be submitting under MTD, uh, are they going to be straightforward? Are they going to be a living nightmare to work with uh, when they've got to do digital record keeping? And then how you might deal with, with each group. So a lot to cover. Uh, a couple of things before we start. Uh, very quick housekeeping. Um, yes, once again, we will be sending a copy of this to you uh, immediately after the webinar. Um, and we'll try and include a link to the first webinar that I just referenced as well in that. Um, we expect there's going to be a lot of questions. There always are. Um, please do post any questions you have in the Q&A box. Only we will see those. If you want to post something that the rest of the you want the rest of the audience to see, use the chat box, but we will not see those. So if you want us to be able to see it, use the Q&A box, basically. Um, and then before we start, um, I should touch on the, there was some news, I say that in air quotes, uh, some news last week uh, from our friends at HMRC. Um, I just wanted to go to Dean to get some response. Dean, was it news or a damp squib? Um, it, I think it's fair to say it wasn't the news we were expecting, really. Oh. So um, from the past sort of six months or, or longer, we've been asking HMRC to give us some... Um, guidance around MTD for it. So you may remember that uh, when MTD for VAT was coming to fruition, they released a document, VAT Notice 700 stroke 22, I think it was, uh, the MTD for VAT Notice, that actually included a lot of comprehensive information. So there was lots of uh, illustrations, um, uh, lots of information explaining what functional compatible software is when the digital links started and finished within that system. Uh, and also what aspects of their guidance had the force of law uh, and, and which is just um, guidance for people's better understanding from HMRC's perspective. So we've been asking for a long time to have the equivalent for ITSA and we thought that was what was going to be released uh, last week in, in the ITSA notice that came out. Um, unfortunately it was a little bit light on guidance uh, in that there was no guidance whatsoever 
Um, all it did really was confirm something that we'd kind of known all along, um, that under it, so the information that you're going to be submitting, so the different income types and different expense categories per um, type of client, whether they're self-employed, property, uh, are by and large going to match what are on today's supplementary pages of the tax return. Um, there wasn't a great deal more in it than that, a little bit about retail scheme, uh, a little bit about um, being able to use three line accounts for smaller businesses. Um, uh, again, this is all information that, that we knew already, so um, yeah, it wasn't so, quite what we were looking for. So damp squib is your, your take? Your words, not <laughs> mine, but uh, it was underwhelming. And Z, did, did, did sure. you, were you more or less impressed than Dean by HMRC's efforts? First of all, I want to say thank you for everyone joining, uh, especially from the Surtax and LinkedIn family and all the, all the people that are watching. We really appreciate your support uh, in this and it makes it a lot of fun. We're looking forward to the questions. Regarding this issue, um, I saw a few articles and obviously Dean's given you a bit of an insight into that. From my perspective, running an accountancy tax advisory practice, that was not what we were expecting. Um, and this is going to cause a few challenges because as we know, uh, and I was saying to the guys off here, that when you look such at a high level, uh, even though it might sound look quite sexy, it causes you a lot of pain when you get down to the detail because you have to always, in these things, look how those numbers are come up, bottom up. And there is going to be some challenges we were touching around the finance restriction and how you put income and expenses and what uh, classification these will cause. So I think there's going to be a lot of challenges. So I think HMRC were deflecting uh, to show it's going to be easy, but we know it's not. Interesting times. It was good to see all that. So let's get into the meat of the discussion for today. Um, so Dean, what is the point? Why are we segmenting our client base? What are we trying to achieve? What are we going to achieve? Okay. So, uh, as we know, this whole webinar series is all about MTD readiness and making sure that you, your team, your clients are good come April 24. My concern is that um, I think some of the practices we work with don't know their own client bases quite as well as they perhaps should, um, which ordinarily is not a problem. But if you don't know exact numbers of clients that you're going to be supporting in April 24, when everybody's got to file to the same quarterly deadlines. You're going to have clients that are going to have to move off their current bookkeeping system onto something new. You're going to have clients that you deal with once a year that you're going to have to start dealing with quarterly. If you don't really know your numbers, then to be able to resource that big change, um, you, you could be wildly out in your estimations of, of mm. how, how many team members you're going to need, how you're going to get that work done. Um, and also, um, I used to play a little game in my practice, Andy, that I know you're keen for me to, for me to share. These games. So uh, once a year, I'd have my fee protection insurance uh, account manager come around and see, see the practice. Uh, and he'd bring with, with him a little note of all my client numbers from the year before, because uh, that was his basis for coming up with the renewal quote. And so he'd present me with this list, uh, and I would have to give him an update on the numbers, so how many sole traders I act for, how many partnerships, how many limited companies, how many property clients. Um, now I'd play a little game whereby I would have a stab off the top of my head of what those client numbers were because I thought I knew my client base pretty well. I, I, could, I thought within, to an accuracy of about five, I could probably um, identify how many of those different client types I acted for. So I'd jot them all down. Uh, he'd be ready to start running the numbers and say, oh, hang on, hang on, don't give me a quote yet. Let me dive into the system and just get the exact numbers. Um, and I did that, and actually every time I did it, I was really surprised about how far off my estimates were, and that I actually didn't know my client base as well as I thought I did. It is terrifying, very illuminating, and I can only imagine the fun that you had playing that game every year. I bet he was really excited to turn up. I'm, to, I'm to, amused by simple to, things. <laughs> to play. But let's, let's play this game. Um, so let's, let's jump into the first poll. Okay, so I'm just going to make the poll live. There we go. So hopefully this has come up on your screens. If it hasn't, uh, towards the bottom right of your browser window, right next to where you've got the option to ask questions, there is a little polls tab. If you click on that, then the poll should present itself to you. Uh, and this is how confident are you that you know your client numbers and, and more specifically how many clients that you'll be 
supporting with MTD for it to come April 24. Are you super confident? Uh, I know my numbers off by heart like I thought I was. Uh, are you reasonably confident? Uh, I have a good idea how many clients are effective. That's probably nearer to where I was. Uh, or are you less confident and you'll cross that bridge when you come to it? I'm keen to know how confident Z is in his numbers. Feeling confident, Z? Uh, Dean really knows the answer. He really done this. And I'll give him the first round of this round two little part. Um, as many accountancy practice owners will know, this is a bit of a challenge because it's a moving feast, and especially when you're repricing and you've got to also think about future clients. So that's our get out jail card, guys. So don't worry about it. You get it wrong. Uh, Dean's loving it, but it's not a big deal. <laughs> so I played this game with Z last yeah. week <laughs> unknowingly. Um, I just casually asked Z, oh, you know, Z, how many sole traders you've got? How many property clients do you act for? Um, and, and then I got got onto his back office and said, oh, he's just asked me to check some numbers with you. Can you run off exactly how many sole traders you represent property landlords? Um, now, I won't tell you the exact figures, um, but Z's keen to know because he doesn't know how far out he was. Um, but he was about 40% out in terms of the numbers of sole traders the X4. You're actually doing much better than you thought you were, Z. You actually act for a lot more sole traders than you, um, than you thought At you were. At the moment. 40% out there. <laughs> It's quite a lot. I, I think the, the big challenge is with this is because it is a moving feast, um, and those numbers will probably be what is as per the last year end. Um, going forward, obviously, a lot of sole traders are quite challenging, uh, and especially with the current climate. So therefore, pricing changes are happening. So uh, probably a reduction there uh, in those. Yeah, I knew he would have uh, an excuse to hand as to, uh, as to why the numbers weren't quite what he was expecting. He was, he was a lot closer with his property numbers, actually, and being a property specialist, you'd hope he's very close to his uh, property clients. Um, just looking at the poll results there, uh, I can see that uh, large proportion are reasonably confident that they've got a good idea. Um, I, I would challenge anybody on here that's reasonably confident to go run those numbers and just uh, play that game and, and see how accurate you were. Um, around 30% less confident um, they across the bridge when they they come to it they should certainly be running numbers uh, and seven percent super confident super they confident. know their numbers are I, quite I, I, well done that's uh, um, a ballsy claim so um <laughs> So we wanted to, to, to basically take you through this, this process and we've, we've, we've created a, a flow chart to help you kind of visualise this. So if we could bring that up, um, we're first of all going to look at the very basic uh, part of this, which is let's just look at who, who is in on a technical level. So which of your clients are going to fall under MTD? So Dean, do you want to just talk through that element? Yeah, sure. And don't worry about... Um Taking everything down, we will make a copy of this um, flowchart available for you uh, after the, the webinar is complete, so you will get a copy of this. Uh, or you could just hit print screen and you get a lovely picture of me with the, with the flowchart <laughs> as well. Um, if I don't say this before, this is great, by the way, guys. This is going to be really helpful for people as they go through the process because you've got to need some kind of uh, process and a checklist. Uh, as you know, account and tax advisors, because we love checklists. Sorry, Dean. Fabulous. Thanks, Steve. So what we're trying to achieve here is basically put our clients into different bundles um, that we can then determine what we need to do now and what can be left for another day. So you notice on each step of the chart that we're going to go through in, in a bit of detail and discuss, um, you'll have an outcome from that chart. So to begin with, we're either going to move fur further along the chart, get ourselves up, up to being MTD ready, uh, or we can dump clients out of the MTD altogether uh, and ignore them for now. So the first question you need to be asking, um, do your clients have self-employed income uh, or property income? Because that is the requirement under MTD for it. So it's those two types of income um, that will determine whether your client falls within MTD for it or not. So you should certainly be able to um, pull off those numbers. Yeah. But then there's other areas that we've got that may or may not you might want to be taken into account down the line. Yeah, I mean, for clarity, it's it's the self-employed individuals uh, and individual property landlords that are the first tranche that come into MTD for ITSA from April 24. Um, other client types that you might have, so partnerships, we are told that they're going to come in in April 25. I personally have my doubts. Um, we're told that companies won't be before April 26. Again, personally, I'm not sure we'll see MTD for corporation tax before 2030. 
uh, and, and trust another client type that we were continually asking HMRC um, to give us clarity on because they can present some real real problems. Um, they've now been pulled out entirely. Of, right? Yeah, out of the regime. Can, can I make a comment on that? Uh, I've got to say, Dean's been really humble there. Uh, Tax Calc and Dean and a few others have made a real a concerted effort to make sure that trusts uh, were pushed back because the complexity, especially a trust, if anyone deals with science pensions, probably discretionary trusts, they're, they're not straightforward. So it's really beneficial that they have been pushed back and kept in the current process. So well done for you guys for that. That's about the only time would be really nice to Dean, so make it count. <laughs> but this is the, I think this is the, where, where, where there is a really interesting debate because when you start saying, mm. okay, well, corporate companies are not included, there's other units that are not included, Included in MTD, there's a potential opportunity here to limit the, your exposure to this. So, I know you you guys may have different views on this, but let, let just if you can just talk us through that what, what we're talking about there. Yeah, I mean, uh, he's got some strong thoughts on on this one for. Ding, ding, we haven't got a bell, but this For is sure. where it starts. So, um, yeah, what do you think, Jim? I, I think uh, the, the challenge we've got here is we don't know what's going to happen. We were talking off air about the future taxation, because obviously, as anyone who's not put their head in the sand, something changed yesterday, the Chancellor changed, and therefore that may change future taxation, i.e. corporation tax, because that's expected to rise uh, in 23 to 25%. That could change the decision, and we probably need to unpack this, and this is where we need to spend a bit of time, uh, hopefully that's all right with everybody, is there's two parts to this. There's trading businesses and investment businesses. They have different impacts. Trading businesses are like accounts practice, most goods and services. Investment businesses are typically property businesses, right? So they've got different implications when you move between the structures, i.e. from a sole trader to a partnership to a limited company. Um, so you do need to take advice uh, from someone who is uh, specializes in that area. Trading businesses tend to be easier because you've got something called gift relief, but investment businesses are a bit more complex and require some very detailed understanding. And the reason why I raise that is the answer will change depending on which ones you are and what you're trying to do. Uh, another variable is how many owners is there. So when we have this discussion, we can't just say, oh, over 25 grand, you must be a limited company or under, because it depends on the circumstances uh, of uh, the structure of the business. And the reason we're going to have a bit of discussion, because as we can see, there's going to be benefits of being in different structures. Assuming, we we'll make the assumption, the tax rates stay the same, uh, because, as we may discuss, uh, chancellors don't tend to like to raise uh, taxes in their first potential budget. And I'm sure Nadim, the new chancellor, uh, hopefully I've got his name right, is going to be thinking about this. So if they stay the same, then we're going to have a, probably a different discussion. So if you're a property business, um, and uh, I know uh, Dean's got his views on, on this area, um, it's going to change. I, I don't, uh, Dean, I, I know when you've worked in practice, there's always a debate, isn't it, between being incorporated or non incorporation Yeah, I mean, f for me, it's another um, big push towards incorporation, another factor that, that comes into play. So typically in the clients that I worked with, um, tax is always a big factor in that. So when you're at the point where the tax savings are going to outweigh the additional costs you're going to incur uh, and, and additional administrative effort you're going to incur from being a limited company, then that's that was always a big driver to becoming incorporated. Um, but for me, having if this gives you the opportunity to defer to somewhere around 20, 30, I reckon, um, the, the requirement to be within MTD for it so, and, and be filing things quarterly, um, then for me, that'd be a big push. So certainly anybody that's borderline today about incorporating, mm. um, I think this would push them over the line and probably a few clients I might pick up that otherwise wouldn't be right for incorporation, but I know they'll be a nightmare um, to, to put through MTD, I'd probably encourage them to incorporate as well. And I think this is where the debate's going to start here. Uh, so Dean makes some very good points. However, there is a big challenge here. The reason being is when you move to a limited company, you have something called double taxation. You have tax from a corporate perspective, a corporation tax, and then you have personal tax pulling it out. Also, you lose, if you're a property business, you lose your annual exemption for capital gains tax. That's that relief that you get annually. Um, and this is the big challenge when you have to weigh it up. Um, and depending on what type of properties you have, I emphasize whether it's residential or commercial, um, and if the finance restriction applies, that 
these all have to be evaluated and this is why you do need to get good advice because you could uh, snook yourself. Also, there is a big cost implication when you move from your uh, uh, properties in your own name to a limited company and uh, a dean will know those two taxes It's called capital gains tax and stamp duty land tax so you have to make sure you've got the right advice you've gone through the right structure uh, to do that that's why property is a bit different whereas trading businesses uh, are a whole different ball game and it can easily be moved over because of something called gift relief so you can easily uh, move those and seek the benefits but you do need to plan it especially if the income tax drops because they're saying it's going to drop down to 90 uh, that may change again as well uh, to new chance. So there's a lot of aspects that you have to get and getting good advice. This is putting us back again, guys, as trusted advisors and anyone people watching who are not from an accountancy tax background, go and see your accountant tax advisor because they can help save you a lot of money with the future planning. And this is so important right now, more than ever. I, I don't know what you think on that, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, property businesses are um, probably have much greater considerations than a, than a trading business. I certainly agree with that. Um, uh, and maybe for property businesses, you could also look at, um, uh, maybe you don't want to put the, the assets into a company, but maybe um, there's a partnership option there as well. Mm. LLPs are uh, not in that first tranche either. Um, if you've got a normal partnership that has a corporate member, then they too are not in that first tranche. Now, I've never, uh, in my practice, um, put a corporate member into uh, a general partnership. Um, so I'm sure there are lots of consequences of, of doing that. But again, is, is that something that could defer um, a number of clients from having to go into MTD from can, the outset? Can I, can I come back on that? So I think Dean's made some fantastic points around the movements. So a lot of times, if people actually understand the property state of partnerships can be a really good uh, way of halfway house because that will defer it but also they do have tax benefits uh, depending if they're husband and wife obviously you have two people at least in a partnership so long as you get the right advice and get the right people so there could be an opportunity to uh, take that process and also um, when partnerships incorporate there's different rules for stamp duty land tax so it can be beneficial then going straight from your name to a limited company and then getting hit with stamp duty land tax so there is a huge benefit you mentioned LLPs I love LLPs uh, and Dean will know because I watch uh, you work follows us on LinkedIn and things like this LLPs are quite complex models especially when you've got mixed LLPs you need to really carefully understand that because there is a lot of uh, general anti-voidist regulations around how you do those so make sure you get a good a tax advice, good legal advice, and maybe financing advice as well uh, to make sure you do those well. But there's huge opportunities. It puts us back in the game, guys. So, so the upshot being, and we do have to move on because we've, we've, we've got a lot to get through, um, the upshot being that there could be significant advantages of, of using uh, LLP, limited company models, to incorporate your clients, get them out of... Out of um, uh, MTD, but be careful uh, because, as he says, there are potentially some unforeseen uh, outcomes. But well worth well worth exploring. So to move on, we've looked at the okay the the, the types of, of of business and which ones are in. But that's not the only characteristic, is it? Because obviously that 10k number comes into play. Um, yeah. we'll very quickly touch on on that, and there's also some some issues around that as well. Yeah, absolutely, and we have had one of the questions come in um, and on the chat there uh, about, about the 10k threshold. About the 10k threshold, which no, was a nice no. segue, I... nice segue into the next uh, next segment. Um, there are also a, another couple of questions. I want to kind of address them now whilst they're um, whilst they're flowing in. Um, Martin's pointed out that HMRC also said that those who have turnover under uh, 85,000, uh, they they can use three-line accounting effectively. So all you're submitting is the turnover each quarter and the total expenses each quarter. You don't need to break down um, that, that expense figure. That was a good point to make. Um, we had questions about charities. We didn't mention charities there, um, but my understanding is that charities are also outside the MTD4. It's a regime. We can double check that and get back to you, but uh, I, I think they're out of the out of the it's a regime, certainly that first tranche. Um, and a question on the property, actually, if property is owned by one spouse, uh, is transferred by one spouse to a partnership with both spouses, will this defer MTD? Not necessarily, it depends. Um, uh, jointly owned property, you would still be uh, within MTD, but for your share of that income. So one option that, again, are other factors to consider, 
Um, but the £10,000 threshold that we're just about to discuss, um, if your gross revenue from that property is less than 20,000, but more than 10, if you own it individually, uh, you're going to be in M MTD because you've breached that 10,000 threshold. But if you split it um, with your spouse and it brings you both below the 10,000, then you won't be within MTD uh, for its regime. So, you know, that's, that's a possibility or a factor to consider as well within when it comes to the ownership. I think the partnership, just please, please do get a bit of advice on that because one of the things people uh, get messed up a lot of times, they do the Form 17 and things like this, is um, that there is potentially stamp duty land tax when you do any movements. So get advice and make sure you do it correctly and, uh, and get the right, uh, right support because I see this too often uh, and a lot of these cases and they cause a lot of problems. So just a bit of warning there. Great. Okay, so if we pop the flow chart back up again and uh, uh, take a look at the next segment in, in that chart, because that, that is where we're asking the question of whether income is greater than £10,000. So when we talk about this £10,000 threshold, what we're talking about here is combined revenue, so that's your gross turnover, from all sources that are relevant for MTD for ITSA. So that is uh, self-employment income, that is any kind of property income, so that's UK property, uh, furnished holiday lettings, uh, foreign property, uh, and a couple of others that I know Z uh, has got some opinions on that actually may get overlooked, I think, by a lot of people. Um, the first of which is home office agreements that, that you might have if you've got a trading company and you're, you're working from home. Yeah, I think uh, that's the area that they always sneak in at these kind of things where people don't really think about it because they use it part of their tax planning for uh, owner managed businesses. So that's going to be interesting how we uh, manage that uh, because that is like a property in itself. Um, so you've got to really think about it, especially if you've got a husband and wife uh, owners of the limited company and they are both uh, got uh, home office agreements, you're going to have a bit of fun. So just be uh, careful on that part. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I was in practice, uh, I'm sure you probably do the same, see, but I'd have proper home office agreements drawn up and, and get my clients signing them to, to show that that, uh, that setup is legitimate. And for some clients, it was appropriate for them to make a profit on that rental income effectively. So the rent that you're charging to your company is greater than the costs that you can attribute. Um, but I think uh, the case that might catch a lot of people out, um, because I've spoken to many accountants who don't draw up formal home office agreements, wow and they just put through um, effectively a use of home as office charge, just as they would for a sole trader, um, because they're saying that the rent they're charging the company cancels out the attributable costs, uh, and they don't do it kind of by the book, and they don't put that income onto the tax returns of the individuals. Um, I think if anybody's doing that, then you've got to be very careful that you know what that rental income figure is, because that will factor into the £10,000 threshold uh, and of course we'd advise that you sort of move towards getting proper home office agreements drawn up for, for your clients. Do you, do you use proper? Y yeah Dean agreements? you have to um, and I think that's been the case for about 15-16 years. I think it was 2006 if I'm right. Uh, the other thing you've got to remember is why you have to charge income to the company and then do expenses is something called the finance restriction section 24 i.e tax on interest so you have to make sure you uh, take advantage or be aware of that because that does affect how you account for the numbers especially if someone's going into the higher rate and therefore your revenue versus expenses is different because of this and I know you're going to go into the fun last one. The last one, yeah. Uh, if we can go, go back to the flow chart because this is another interesting one, I find this. So, um, yes, you, you, you might be able to limit the number of, of uh, clients that you've got under MTD uh, through the, the, the incorporation side, but there's another, another way, and this was the, 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 the digitally excluded. Um, so do you want to just, just talk to it, because it, it is quite a complex one. Yeah, uh, but again, just before, we, just before I do, I just want to pick up on a couple of questions that have come in. So one question is, um, is dividend, in dividend income included in the 10K threshold for directors? No, it isn't. You can ignore any other forms of income. It's only income from self-employment and property that factors into that. Uh, if you've got jointly owned property, then it's only that individual share of the total revenue that comes into the equation uh, and also we had a question about rental room relief which that was the one again is another interesting one. Oh, Dean uh, that one is an absolute shocker for me I'll be honest with you 
why have they got rent and room relief in the courtly when you got exemption of seven seven and a half thousand pounds and you have to report it I don't actually understand that one uh, and I will be uh, if uh, everyone's happy raising that with HMRC because it doesn't make sense it's just added headaches the whole point of rent and room relief was to make your life easier and it seems like we have this continuous, uh, I know we're not talking about VAT, but flat rate scheme, same process. That something that's easy, everyone gets used to, HMRC don't like that, and then they do a bit of a snooker, and then make people having to think different. So I think that's going to be a pain in the back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Angry. And I think the point there is that, um, or the difficulty there is that um, if you if you're renting out a room in your house and you're claiming rent a room relief, then on your tax return you can just tick the box and you don't actually have to report what that income figure is because it's covered by the allowance. Um, now, as well as having that rent, now that's going to be below seven and a half thousand. So if, if that's on its own, that's fine. You're not going to be under MTD. Um, but what if you do have some self-employment income as well that's below the 10k threshold, or you've got another property that you're renting out that's for less than 10k a year? You may be completely unaware that, that you or your client has actually gone over the £10,000 um, limit because of the rent that they're receiving uh, for, a, for a lodger in their property. And that's even if they tell you that they're receiving rent from there. Uh, I, I think, Dean, you raise another really good point there, which people think, what if you normally what people do is they look at the expenses or from the, the rent and room relief and they look to see if that's more than the revenue because you have an option. So imagine you're earning 10 grand rent and you notice your expenses are so you take the seven and a half so you're only paying on the two and a half thousand now you've got a problem because you didn't even think about this and you had the choice to do it on themselves and now you have to assume they're giving you the right numbers as you go along and that may change between the years uh, especially with uh, everything going up at the moment because of inflation that's going to be a big impact and I think that just needs to be thought through and that's why I was saying what I was saying earlier yeah Okay, so are we are we ready to talk about the digitally excluded? We are. No, we've got another question about the template. Oh, one more question has come in. Um, it's good because I do want to I do want to get to all the questions that come in. Um, Samantha's asked if if a couple receive eighteen thousand pounds of income from a rental property, uh, this would be nine k each, and this would be below the ten thousand pound threshold. Yes, absolutely, they would be fine for now. But the tax year that this will be evaluated on is the current tax year that we're in 22-23. So any clients that you've got like that that are on the cusp, then you will have to keep monitoring them to see uh, if they do go over that 10,000 threshold in the current tax year that we're in. Because if they do, then they'll be in uh, from April 24. We must move on because we're going to get more questions about the 10K threshold <laughs> again. Every time it's the 10K you threshold. You love the 10K threshold. <laughs> <laughs> we could do a four hour webinar. And um, still just do the 10K threshold. So, OK, um, as promised, the, the digital exclusion uh, group. Um, yeah, the, I think this is quite interesting because it's, it could potentially help with a number of your clients, especially those who are going to potentially struggle when asked to maintain digital records. Now, I don't know is whether they're going to change the threshold so that certain people are, are, can be excluded. But what, what, what did you have on this? Uh, well, this is a really interesting one for me because this is, uh, we've had this since uh, MTD for VAT. Um, so there is an option for anybody that isn't able to use technology um, on the basis of age, disability, religion, remoteness of location, or any other reason that you can argue with with HMRC that they can be excluded completely from MTD and that's for VAT and for income tax. Um, having spoken to some practices, they, they go hard after getting these digital exclusions on behalf of their clients and they have quite a decent success rate, but they the success rate, but they do admit that it's quite a lengthy process to go through and you have to do a lot of convincing um, with HMRC to prove that they're uh, not capable for for those reasons. Um, whereas I speak to other people in practice and they either weren't aware that this existed as an option or they didn't feel that it was worth the effort to try and get that exclusion. Yeah, and it might not have been worth the effort for VAT, um, but income tax is a, is a different ball game, so may, maybe mm. it is worth that that extra effort. What, what do you think, Z? Would you be? Have you ever done that? We haven't actually uh, done too many of these because when we looked at MTD uh, for VAT, that um, it was not it was not something that uh, HMRC 
were so uh, well at communicating um, because they were saying, oh, you can do bridging software, which was a tough thing, as many people know, because we try to get people on formalized software. So it's going to be interesting because I was reading up on this uh, and Dean was kind enough to uh, help me here, send me some stuff on it. And we were looking through on the digital exclusions. It's, it's quite um, widespread of what, what that could potentially be. And I think this is the big challenge that we've got is what will HMR, what is their tests for applying these? Because this will be work that an accountant tax advisor will have to do. So it'd be really useful from HMRC to give us uh, some examples so we know how to test because this is a service that you're going to have to provide to your clients who you know are going to struggle, who are not very uh, digital savvy. Um, and that could be from all ages, depending on their exposure to technology. They may not even have broadband in the area. There is certain places like this. Um, uh, I know the one about religions mentioned, I always confuse how that one comes in, but that may be for some people who uh, haven't had exposure to technology uh, be due to their faiths. So there's a huge area here to explore. And this could be a good way of keeping those clients, because I know a lot of account tax advisors do care about their clients, and hopefully we, myself and Dean fall in that category um, as well. And we want to make sure that we can help people where it's required, not to be as an excuse, but try to help them to be able to uh, fit in the program and not be stressed out about this, because this is the biggest concern a lot of people have, is being stressed out about something new. Yeah, I'd be really interested to know actually if people have been successful in, in mm. getting their clients digitally excluded. So do just um, pop a pop comment a in the in, chat yeah. if you've had some sex and perhaps success uh, with that one uh, and, and perhaps what the reason was that you got that, that exclusion. Because also it does automatically carry forward. If you get the exclusion for VAT, then that individual will be automatically digitally excluded for income tax as well. I think Dean, just one, one more last point. I know we're always running out of time, but no, for the VAT for people becoming digital for VAT below the 85,000, they could actually potentially do both at the same time. Um, so there's a bit of an opportunity, a bit of a window still for that. And it'd be really useful to, as Dean said, let us know which ones have been accepted so we can then share it with uh, the rest of the community of account tax advisors. So thank you for that. Excellent. OK, so we must move on. Um, so we've Use that. If we could go back to the uh, the, the the graphic, um, we've we've kind of gone through the the, the 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 more straightforward end. So we've now defined. Okay, who can we, we we can put into that ignore bucket, which we want to probably put as many many clients as possible in there. Then you end up with the ones who we are going to have to deal with. So they, they they've not been put into the ignore bucket. First question you're going to need to ask is 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 about the digital record keeping. Um, so, you know, I think it's going to be: Are they keeping records digitally? So, what what what, what do you see as the process for that? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things here. Obviously, it's making tax digital. I don't particularly like the word tax in it, but um, yeah, the digital makes sense. The record keeping has got to be digital. Um, we know that spreadsheets are an acceptable form of digital record. Um, we have bridging solutions for VAT, we have our bridging solution for income tax. So if you've got clients that are using spreadsheets, then, then that's acceptable um, under MTD for it, so just as it is for MTD for that, so we can support those. But in the context of segmenting your clients, you want to understand um, what is the current bookkeeping system that they're using. If they're using um, a, a digital system, whether that's spreadsheets or software, then great, let's move on to the next step. Um, if they're keeping things manually, then something's going to have to change between now and April 24, um, because that won't be acceptable if they fall within MTD for income tax. So you will have a process of moving those clients off what they're doing now into what um, they need to be doing come April 24. Now you may have spent a lot of time just getting them to do manual records to a, a decent position. You might think, I've spent all that time, I've, they're finally sending me something I can use and now I've got to teach them something yeah. completely different. Um, do you think you're going to have clients in that category, Z? Yeah, we're definitely going to have clients in that category. We've spent time, especially for MTD VAT, um, to get them on digital records. Uh, as Dean knows, we use Zero for our bookkeeping software, and we try to standardise the process to get the efficiencies. I think this is going to be a challenge, um, how you train, um, and using webinars like this to communicate to your clients. Uh, so if you haven't watched the previous one, we used that to communicate to our clients. We're going to use this one just so people are aware of what's coming, and then put steps like tangible steps, like what we spoke 
spoke about in the flow diagram, so that's why it's so, so powerful, is how are we going to do it by step by step, let them know, hold their hands, get my team to be able to do that, be as a fallback, because it is scary, it's different for them, they're not used to this, they've just, a lot of people have gone from just giving you a piece of paper to be able to give you CSV files, for example. Yeah, so it's a big change. So I, I totally agree with what Dean's saying there. It's going to be a big challenge. Yeah, and you may also have clients that are keeping perfectly acceptable digital records in bookkeeping software, but that sop software provider is not necessarily going to build any functionality to, to make the submissions. We know the big providers in the UK are going to um, develop that functionality, but in my practice, I must have had clients on 20 different bookkeeping software systems, um, mainly my Mac clients would use all kinds of weird and wonderful um, bookkeeping products, usually from the US. Uh, they're not going to be building any MTD filing capability within that product. So I need to know who those clients are and I need to be speaking with those clients to say, look, we've got this coming. I know you like this current software that you're using at the moment, but you've got a couple of choices. Are we going to move you onto a piece of software that's going to allow the filing? Or are we going to have to extract that data as a CSV every quarter and then use bridging software to submit it. Ideally, we don't want to do that, but actually if they're using software they're comfortable with, they're running their business with, they might have it, their invoicing systems interlinked with their payment systems, they don't want to be messing around changing software when they're already keeping records mm. digitally. So, so realistically, your process is going to need to be to you know, get a list of all those clients that are in and then put a category, are they doing bookkeeping? Are they doing Excel spreadsheet? And where you know that, you may, I guess, have to call them up or you may have to get in touch with them some other way uh, and ask that question. But I think it's vital that you've got that list and you can break that down and, and, and filter and segment. Can, can I just add a quick point? I know we're also finding out it's the software strategy that we were talking in the previous um, uh, webinar. You've got to make a decision. You can't just sit on the fence, make a decision for your practice, be brave, communicate it, give people time to digest it, and that will uh, get a lot of benefit for you and your practice and get adoption by your clientele. That's, yeah. that's my recommendation. And we will, we, we will be looking at uh, both client communication and uh, technology in future webinars coming up a little bit later in the summer. Um, there was one point about the VAT quarters with it, sir. Uh, Oh yeah, this is an interesting one, and um, we, we might have a differing op opinion here. Um, this this so. came up in the last uh, <laughs> webinar as, as well, and that's about aligning VAT, your VAT quarters for your clients that are um, registered for VAT and filing under MTD for VAT with the ITSA quarters, because you can't change the ITSA quarters. They are defined. They coincide with the tax year, so they're going to be 31st of March, uh, 31st of July, 30th of September, 31st of December, uh, assuming you go for a calendar year election rather than mess around with those five days. That's another another topic. Um, where do you stand? Are you going to be changing all your non-stagger one VAT quarters to match your ITSA quarters? I, I think uh, Dean and we had a conversation last time, you watched that, and I, I've, I've reconfirmed it. No, definitely not changing it. And I'll explain to you why. Right. First of all, from a, a work perspective, running the workflow is impossible to manage. Secondly, most bit of sole traders we run are on an in, in, um, invoice basis, accrual basis, uh, which uh, is different to the cash basis for property uh, and most of the stuff for income tax. So they are different. So if they're different, why are you changing them? I, I don't understand what the benefit is of changing them because you're going to end up having to do all the work in the same quarters. What are you going to do for the rest of the periods? Are you just going to throw all your funds? What are you going to do? So I'll challenge back on that, Dean. I think most people run it like that uh, because of the tax reliefs and exemptions that you get from an invoice basis so yeah so what our viewers should be doing <laughs> is changing their VAT quarters to align with <laughs> the MTD it's the quarters um, yeah I mean the reason I would do it personally is that if you're keeping your bookkeeping in one system yes you're having to do all your work uh, at the same quarter you've got one month turnaround for the the it's a filing um, but it should be the same data. You should be able to do it at the same time. If you're going to be reviewing the spreadsheet uh, for the VAT filing, even though you're sending different figures, you should be able to look at the same data 
uh, and do the MTD IPSA one. There'll be, there'll be two separate filings for sure. You can't do the, the same filing. It's a separate VAT one, a separate IPSA one. Uh, all the different property types are separate submissions, so you're going to need a separate record for every type of property you've got. Um, UK, furnished holiday lettings, foreign. Um, but personally, I would like to do all that at once, because otherwise you're going to be chasing clients up twice a year um, for their bookkeeping data, which, which is uh, sorry, twice a quarter for their bookkeeping data, and it's already hard enough to do it do it once a quarter. Um, we, 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 we really one? have to move Just on because we got no, we've got uh, literally 15 minutes, and we, we're going to okay. miss we're out on some core stuff. So uh, I do, do apologise. Um, okay, so we, we've looked into um, you know how they're going to do this, but we're looking at digital savviness now. I mean, you're talking about a very a soft skill, and yeah, if you've got very few clients, it's relatively easy to go. Yeah, I know. They're, they're not going to be able to get it, they are going to get it. When you've got a reasonable number of clients there, how on earth are you going to be able to determine which ones are going to get there when, you know, with whatever software solution that you give them to keep digital records? I don't know if there is a good answer to this. I don't know if there is a clean answer to this, but what, 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 what are you doing, Z? I think the really important question, I think you need to assess every uh, client um, and we were joking last time about is it do you have to test them by sending a spreadsheet but what else can you do you're going to have to either test them on the software and see how they do it and how they feel before it goes live so they get used to doing those and you explain to them what you're doing or they're going to have to use spreadsheets and then be able to fill them in uh, effectively and that's the only way you can actually assess because some I've met clients that I thought well they, they'll do this in their breeze and they've totally messed it up and I'm like, whoa. So it's so hard to assess just from uh, you know, stereotyping people. You have to get them to actually do it, assess them, and then speak to them and say, look, these are the things that you've done wrong. So I suggest you do it this way uh, and then do that. So we're going to have to factor in a lot of service into this. So potentially literally testing your clients and and if they fail that test I, I think then they're gonna to have to make a decision whether they want you to do the bookkeeping or your team uh, to do the booking because obviously it's got to be feasible it's got to be fair for both sides um, if they're gonna struggle and it's gonna give them loads of stress you've got to try to relieve their stress and try to under make them understand uh, and that's the challenge of uh, being owner mm. of a practice these days is how do you communicate how do you uh, have that negotiation and conversation with them because you sometimes only negotiate with them or a lot of times to be honest. Yeah, it's a great point. See, I wonder if we can pop that graphic um, back up again because the reason we're trying to establish whether our clients are tech savvy or not is because we've got this far down the um, down the flow chart down the path. Um, we we know that they're not using digital records right now. Um, we know they have to start using digital records. Are they capable? Um, so you're going to have to have a decision. If, if you determine that they're not capable of using the software, and for me, um, although I had a broad mix of clients, some were using software, some were using spreadsheets, some were doing things manually, I'd always want them to be, be doing digital record keeping. So if I couldn't, if I've not managed to persuade them to use digital record keeping yet, it's probably because they're not tech savvy or they're not engaged in it, they don't want to. Um, so, so for me, this would send them down the no path, which then gives you the decision, okay? So if you're not going to do it, um, we either do it all for you, um, which, which we call the full service in this, this scenario, or you find someone else to, to work with because we can't be spending an inordinate amount of time with clients that don't want to pay us to do the work but still expect us to help them to do it knowing that they don't really want to and they're probably not capable. Yeah. Um, for me, that kind of leads to the, uh, the, 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 the second horrible, item there, the horrible dis the disengage, horrible which no one, you know, no one wants to be disengaging their <laughs> clients, but you've also got to think about your own practice and, and whether it's going to be viable for you to work with that type of client yeah. in future. Do, do you think you'll be... Uh, that I think it's already started to happen, Dean, to be honest. Uh, we've already started evaluating and having these conversations. Uh, some clients are saying, no, we don't want that. That's their choice. Um, I think the part that we discuss about digitally excluded is quite important in this conversation. So before you get to that point, make sure you've done that analysis, spoke to them. Then it could make the life easier because you are fighting for them because we do work 
for the client, uh, as people always challenge us whether we work for HMRC or there. No, we work for the client. So you've got to try to make sure you're covering that off. If you do, uh, and I think you then cover all the bases covered, then what else can you do after you've gone through all these steps? But that's the last resort, not the first resort. Yeah, good point, good point. So, OK, so we're left at the end of going through this process with effectively you've got four buckets. You've got those that you can ignore straight away. You've got those that are all ready for MTD. You've got ones who are, who are not digital, but they're probably going to be able to get there. And there's ones that probably aren't. And if you can be able to break your group down into those four, then you're going to be in a very much better position and do that as early as possible because it could take some time to start making the other decisions that you're going to need to come to. One of the interesting things that kept me thinking throughout the whole process of this is um, what technology, uh, how, how can technology help? Certainly with the first part of that. And Jean, I think you've prepared some a uh, bit of a show of how TaxCalc users are able to use the data mining features that we have within TaxCalc to be able to do exactly this. So Dean, please take a look. Yeah, sure, I'll do a little quick um, demonstration of how you might get the information that you need out of uh, our, our software if, if you're a TaxCalc customer. Uh, it's, this is probably how uh, Z's team back in the office got the information out to give to me um, because they can't be relying on, on the information that, uh, that Z presents. Um, Hopefully you'll be able to see uh, my screen. There we go. Um, so this is the, the tax account suite. We've got all the solutions uh, in there. I think one of the underutilized areas of uh, the suite is probably practice manager as a whole. Any product you buy from us, you get practice manager um, uh, with it. But the report manager that we have within practice manager, I think is a really good tool for getting information out of your database. Um, so we ship the product with a whole range of interesting reports that people can just run um, to give them a temperature check on their practice. Um, you can also create your own reports, and I've created one here called MTD Readiness. Um, so I'll just go through the edit process just to show you how I've made up the, the report. Um, so MTD Readiness, uh, it's, an, it's a evaluation. Um, within this first section, the client selection, uh, we've got an option here called Advanced Client Selection or Data Mine. This is one of my favorite areas uh, of Report Manager because you can basically go in here and set any kind of parameters that you like to give you different lists or different segments of your client base. So I always find it super useful. Uh, and in this one, I'm just basically pulling up all my clients that have self-employment pages, have UK property pages, and the different criteria for MTD so that I can get all my MTD relevant clients. Um, now, I could have set it up so that it only shows those that are earning 10,000 or more, and I probably will do that uh, once all my 22, 23 tax returns are done, because that's the year that's important for MTD. But for now, I want to get a good understanding of my clients, so I'm, I'm using the 21 tax year, which is um, the, the only tax year that will have all my clients' uh, data in there. Uh, Z might have all these 22 year clients in there because he'll, he'll have done most of his 22 tax returns by now. I'm laughing at the names because that's just suddenly changed. I've, I've, yeah, I, I, there's going to have to be some changes to uh, my my client list, not all of these. Uh, this is a real client list. All uh, right, yeah, yeah, not all of them uh, are in business anymore. <laughs> so that's the list of clients that are in the report, which obviously is very useful um, uh, from, from what we've been talking about, segmenting your client base. Uh, but what information do we actually want to present for these? And in the customization area, this is basically, um, we've got your list of clients, Dean, what information do you want on those clients? And there's all kinds of stuff that you can pull out uh, about the individuals, um, the business. You can go into any of the tax returns, um, pull out all kinds of information from tax return fields. Um, but the information that I particularly want for this report, I've, I've put over on the, the right hand side here. Um, and we'll save that and generate the report. Okay, so this is a report up on screen. Whenever I generate a report in the software, I always go to export and dump it out into Excel because then I can play around with it and sort it and reorder it and do, do what I like with it. Um, but I think just for today, I shall print that to make that a little bit bigger on screen. But you can pull up Boris's one, are you? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look. Um, so the information I've presented, so we've got a list of the clients that are affected by MTD. Um, 
these are some of the criteria. So have they got self-employment pages? Have they got UK property? Are they claiming rent a room? Which I think is important. So we can see those. Um, particularly Hector the inspector here, who hasn't actually got any gross income, but we can see that he is claiming rent a room relief. So we know he's got uh, in receipt of some, some uh, rental income from a lodger. It's important to know that. Um, and yeah, we can also report on the gross business income of your clients. So that adds up uh, all the income from self-employment and all the income from various um, property sources. So you can see whether they've gone uh, above the £10,000 threshold or they're approaching it. Uh, if, if you don't see on that system today, that, that's a new, new item that's coming out in uh, summer release, which I think is due uh, in the next week or so. Uh, I can also pull out the usual year end of the business. Uh, we haven't talked about basis period reform. That's probably a webinar topic in its own. Um, but it's important to know which of your clients have got 5th of April year ends, 31st of March, um, 30th of April, 30th of December. Uh, what are you going to do with all your non-tax year so, ends? So? Uh, obviously Rishi Sunak is causing havoc here because he's got 31st of December. I've got some of those that are that. Those are going to be interesting conversations because obviously the first year, uh, depending on their tax position, could be quite hefty because obviously the overlapping profits and the base pairs are going to be painful. And I know, uh, Dean, you've done a really good webinar on that. Maybe uh, send that link out so people can see that because that will give them insight on what the impacts are of that. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of challenges. Yeah, and basis period reform is with us regardless of MTD. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I certainly recommend running report on all the usual year ends of your businesses so you know which ones to take a look at and see if it's you need to consider changing year end and if so, in which tax year you're going to do it. Uh, the last three columns here I'll just quickly mention. Um, I've set these up as custom fields. Another great part of uh, the report manager is that you can set up all kinds of custom fields within the in the system. So even if the data isn't in there today, um, you, you can pretty much create whatever you like. So I've created one called digitally excluded, yes, no, maybe. So um, I know which of my clients already have a digital exclusion, so I can ignore them for ITSA. Uh, and I've also identified someone, some that I think probably aren't capable of using technology. So <laughs> Boris, maybe, maybe. We'll, maybe we'll go through the process of, of um, applying. I'm not sure I believe some of those numbers as well. Same, same for tech savviness, same for tech savviness. And uh, I've also got one for MTD, digital start day, because if they're in, you want to know when they're in from. So individuals, 6th of April 24, Partnerships potentially sixth of April, twenty five. Um, it's it's the functionality is there. It's 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 with the software. There's no. It looks great, by the way, Dean. Uh, it'd be really good to get more insight on that because that's going to be quite a bit of a difference maker, especially when you're evaluating and keeping up to date. Yeah. Great. Right. So we've got a solution there. Thank you very much for showing us that, Dean. Um, we are about two minutes from going over time. We've still got several bits to cover uh, and we've probably got some questions uh, I think that we, we want to be answering. So we're going to try and get through. We probably will run over. I do apologise for that. But if you want to stay with us, please do. If you can't, you will be getting a recording of this so you can review that at your leisure. Uh, we do try and keep the time, but it's not always that possible. So. Um, a few other questions that I wanted to bring up. So um, we've, 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 we've looked at the demo. It's probably worth going to the next poll, isn't it? And just wrapping yes. up from, from where we are. So I shall make this poll live. Um, so have we managed to convince you today that formally segmenting your client base and putting them into different buckets uh, is a good thing to do? You've got a number of options there. Um, no need, I've already done it. Well done, you're ahead of the game. Um, yes, uh, it is a good thing to do. I'm just intrigued to play Dean's game, if nothing else. Uh, or finally, you get the principle, but I'm not gonna do it. Uh, I've got more pressing things in my practice to deal with, or I just don't think MTD is gonna happen, so I'm not going to be uh, segmenting my client base. Thank you very much. And just so you know, if you do go to the Dean for a Christmas party or something and he does suggest playing the games, <laughs> just don't know. 88% um, well, of people would disagree. And no, no, they want, they, everyone wants to play Dean's game. <laughs> That's incredible. Would, uh, would come and join me for a game love of Guess it, Your Client Love base. it. Dean's well, really done it on me. He's, he's really good at this, by the way, guys. Really good. Still, yeah, 85%. So looking, looking, looking like your game is very popular. <laughs> Excellent. So while we get those in, do you want to have a quick chat through um, 
some of the other points that we wanted to make because we, once you get to that end point, mm -hmm. you've got to start going, well, what, what, what are you going to do? Um, the ignore list, we put those in at the beginning and we said, okay, we, we're not going to worry about those because we've incorporated or they've got digital uh, exclusion. Do we just leave them? We're going to have to... I mean, I did call it the ignore for now. <laughs> ignore for now, it was. Because they're not the highest priority. Um, but they still need to know what's going on. Um, they still may come into MTD at some point. Uh, so I think they need that awareness. So I don't think we can ignore them from a communication mm. perspective. Um, but they're, they're not the ones that are going to present the immediate problem. But at least if you've got them in a list such as we've built, you know where they are and you can, you can keep track of them. Um, we are going to talk a lot more about communication over the next couple of months, so we'll come on to those, those areas, um, a bit more on that later. Um, the, the concept of digitising those people who are capable, is that going to be, I mean, I think we're going to be covering that in another webinar as well. Yeah, I mean, that's a key decision, isn't it? We've talked about, um, do we do it for them? Do we help them to do it for themselves? Or do we send them to someone who's better placed to, to give them that service if we can't? Yeah, we do have a webinar that's going to be on uh, coming up in at the tail end of August where we're going to start looking at communication with clients and, and that's going to feature in there. So I know one of the issues that's come up a lot today is, is around property. And it was one of the reasons we wanted Z there. Uh, you had some, some points to make about how, how, how potentially risky this area is. Yeah, I mean, for me, to me, they're the high risk category. Um, I don't know whether it's a reflection of my own client base, but my property clients um, didn't see their property as a business. Uh, very few of them kept any formal records. Many of them have to say, I have to say, would you send me an email once a year saying, oh, same as the last year, Dean, and I spent <laughs> Two hundred pound on fixing the back door. Um, so I think any accountant today that specialises in the property sector, and we know a few property specialists, don't, don't we, we? I Andy? think there's one nearby. Um, I think I think they're probably on borrowed time. I, I, I'd question the Dean. The, is your business at risk? Uh, uh, Dean, I, I like Dean how he puts it. I really appreciate <laughs> that, Dean. But do you know what? How, wherever there's risk, there's an opportunity, and it depends on how you differentiate yourself. And for me, this is the biggest opportunity ever because this puts us right in the mix and it makes us help and make that discussion, uh, be involved in the discussion. Because when we're talking about incorporation, property portfolio, especially from an inheritance tax perspective, are such an important bit to think about. How are you going to pass this along? Because people don't realise that's going to hurt a lot, especially with property prices rising. So you can use this as a platform to start educating people around uh, their legacy, um, and also how do they minimise their taxation because when it's in their own name as we know uh, or joint ownership it's a bit of a killer especially if one person's earning more than uh, the in a higher rate tax band or close by they're going to get penalised on the finance restriction so we're becoming more important not less important because people want to know how do I mitigate this and we suggested some things here without getting into deep in the tax advisory aspect it was around properties uh, into partnerships uh, LLPs all the different aspects around that and potentially incorporation to limited companies got to have those conversations so I dispute what Dean's saying I think we're back in the uh, main part of the picture because people need more advice now than ever and this is highlighting why they need it Dean over to you yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> you make some excellent points there Z uh, uh, I think if yeah if you are a property landlord then it certainly pays to see a specialist for all the factors outside of uh, tax alone um, for me personally, I'd be incorporating every sole trader and disengaging every property client <laughs> and waving goodbye to this MTD problem till 2030. Uh, I, I think, Dean, you, you know, really good points. There is a lot of challenges putting that aside, but I think people need to really invest time, get good advice, because this is an opportunity, as we mentioned, from sole trader partnerships is one way. Uh, or LLPs and then to limited companies. So really, really get the advice. We're back in the main part, guys. Use this as an opportunity. As I said before, half full, not half empty. And that's how you've got to look at this. Don't put your head in the sand. Make sure you're there, the, the person to go to. 
Excellent. So whether you're um, uh, in, in the charting the, the risky waters of the property business or you're, you're in the safe area, what it does prove to do is start working now. Let's get that list, get your, uh, your, your clients lined up. So before we wrap up, we are really going to have to wrap up. Um, questions, Dean. I know there's a whole bunch in there. I don't know if there's anything that you particularly wanted to get to uh, sooner rather than later. Um, there's, there's probably more than we can get through in the time now, but what I will do is compile all the questions that came in, uh, put answers to them all, and we'll make that available uh, on our website so people can come in and see the, the Q&A and also get a copy of that uh, flowchart that we put together as well. Yeah, there's going to be a lot uh, coming to you uh, off the back of this, as we promised. So without, we, we really do have to wrap up. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Z. Thank you, Dean. It's really, I, I love doing these sessions. Um, and thank you for coming. Um, really hope you found that useful. Uh, I, I've, I've learned a lot and there is a, a clearly a lot to think about. Uh, we'd love your feedback. Please uh, email um, uh, in if you've got any suggestions or any particular ideas that uh, you're using and we can, we can add those to the mix and bring those up. Uh, so if you've got no ideas around how you can do that segmentation process, send them in. Um, I should tell you as well, we're getting between 600 and about 1,000 people coming along to these, these webinars, which we are absolutely thrilled about. But obviously, given the number of firms that we know are not making plans and they're not uh, uh, getting on top of this, do share this around. So when we send you those, the, 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 the follow-up email, share it around, help other firms uh, get to where they need to be. Um, so we are going to take a little break from uh, MTD over the summer. Um, we've got a session coming up that's going to be looking at communication. So that's communication to clients and communication to staff. Um, that is slated for the 24th of August. It may change, but we will be communicating about that a little bit nearer the time. Um, but Dean and I will be back uh, on the 20th of July. Uh, we're going to do a refresher about uh, anti-money laundering uh, regulations. Um, it's it's going to be quite a basic session. If you've already got your uh, robust uh, money laundering uh, protocols in place, you can probably skip that one. But if, like many firms, you're doing a couple of ID checks at the beginning of an engagement, uh, you may want to, to, to come along and just check to make sure that you are meeting the, the, the minimum requirements uh, of AML. Um, so uh, we, will, we will see you on the 20th if you want to join us for that one. Otherwise, we'll be back on the 24th of August. Until then, have a wonderful summer and uh, we'll see you then. <laughs>